Good afternoon and welcome to our Ryan series of speakers. We would like to acknowledge with respect the Lwangwins peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt and Wasanich peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. From wherever you are joining us, I invite you to acknowledge that you are not the first people to tread upon the land beneath nor gaze into the skies above to dream. I am pleased to welcome this afternoon our Orion guest, Ravi Jain, a multi-talented and award-winning theater maker based in Toronto. Audiences in Victoria may recall the charming performances of he and his mother in Brimful of Asha, or the stark and beautifully brutal production of Iceland that Ravi directed. Both were produced by Why Not Theater and appeared during past Spark Festivals at the Belfry Theater. Ravi Jain trained at the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, New York University's Tisch School of the Arts, and the Jacques Lecoq School in Paris. He has worked internationally as an actor, director, and producer, and is presently the artistic director of Why Not Theatre, a company he founded in 2007. It now has an annual budget of $2 million, has launched 55 new works, garnered 44 nominations and awards, and has had 81 national and international tour stops. Clearly committed to Why Not Theater, he continues his association with other theaters, including the Shaw Festival, where he directed an acclaimed production of Lisa Codrington's adaptation of The Adventures of the Black Girl in Search, of, in Search for God, and a premiere of The Orchard by Serena Parma, an adaptation of Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard, featuring a South Asian family struggling to retain its farm in the Okanagan. Ravi was commissioned by the Shaw Festival to devise a two-part adaptation of the 4,000-year-old Hindu epic Mahabharata, which was to be, have been premiered last year, but unfortunately was postponed due to the pandemic. Ravi was shortlisted for the 2016 and 2019 Siminovich Prize. He won the 2012 Pauline McGibbon Award for Emerging Director and the 2016 Canada Council John Hirsch Prize for Direction. Ravi has established himself as an artistic leader known for his inventive productions that spin theatrical magic. In part, his success lies in his refusal to be compartmentalized. He experiments with a wide range of performance practices and materials. Actor Christine Horn says of Ravi, one of the wonderful things about Jane is that there is not one thing he does. He's skilled enough and smart enough to do anything. There are infinite possibilities that come out of him. I watch his stuff and think, I will follow you anywhere. I present to you Ravi Jain and his lecture, Asking Why Not? Challenging Assumptions and Unlocking Possibilities. Following the lecture, we will have an opportunity to ask questions. So if any questions arise during his lecture, um, please type them in the chat and we'll have Ravi respond to them. Thank you very much, Ravi. Thank you, Jan, for that amazing introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, making sure I'm unmuted. Okay, good, I'm good. Uh, hello, folks. Uh, listen, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I'm super grateful to be included in this keynote and this event and, and this intimate group of people. Um, as Jan said, you know, I've been to the Belfry a couple of times, so I know how lovely your part of the world is. And I really wish I was there uh, because I don't love, I was saying to Jan before this, it's really hard, as you all know, to speak to the void of the Zoom room. You know, I don't get the energy and the feedback. I can't even, I, you're just names to me here. I see my buddy, Matt, hi. Um, so, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna digital pivot here and I'm just gonna tell a story. Um, so, you know, the story is to share a little bit about me and my story and the story of Why Not Theater. And the lens through which I'm gonna tell that story is to really focus on the idea of finding your own voice and uh, you know the challenge that all artists encounter at some point in their career. Do I join the institution or do I do my own thing? Or do I build my own institution? Is that even possible? And this tension for me between the institution and kind of the, the one way of doing things and then following my impulse and my gut for the multiple ways of doing things is a, has been a big kind of hallmark of my life. And so for me, so much of my journey in the theater has been to ask why, you know, why do I do theater? What is its purpose? You know, why is it even important? And why do we do it the way that we do it? And who's it for? 
Um, and so like early in my career, I realized that the business that I'm interested in, my business is change making. And that theater or storytelling is just one of the tools, one of the ways to do that. So just to step back a little about me. So my parents immigrated from India in 1974. And I grew up in my house in the 1980s. I was an 80s baby. Um, you guys are probably 90s or something crazy or 2000s. Anyway, so um, I grew up in a house where stories were just like always being told. And the louder you were, the more attention you got. So everyone was always competing for stories. And stories were a place to really understand, you know, the country that my parents had come to and share the memories and news of home and figure out this hybridity of cultures that was now part of their lives. They had these Canadian kids and this Indian way of life and, you know, really trying to make sense of it through, through the sharing of the stories of how do you deal with this? How, what are you learning? And we would sing and, and tell stories. There was tons of food and family till very early in the mornings on the weekends. And there was no theater. Nobody ever talked about theater. Theater wasn't a part of our lives. It was actually our lives. And so growing up, you know, for my parents in particular, education was like super important to them because both of my parents, neither of them pursued secondary education. And for my dad in particular, it was a really big thing to prioritize school. So they always supported me whenever I wanted to pursue school. And it was a huge privilege to have the financial support to be free and to go abroad. And as Jan rifled off in my resume or bio, I'm going to talk a little bit about the choices I made um, and the opportunities that I had. So I first, right out of high school, I was 19 years old. This is 1999. Uh, again, some of you were probably born. Um, I went to a school, a drama school in London called Lambda, the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. And at the time it was a really big deal. Uh, it's, it's, there were sort of two major competing schools in the UK, RADA and Lambda. And um, I was one of two North Americans to be selected for the three-year course which was, you know, a big deal. And, and the other North American who was selected happened to be my best friend. And we, we were catapulted at 19 to go to England and live on our own and find a flat. And it was crazy. And so here we were at this classical theater school. So focused primarily on Shakespeare, the Greeks, um, the Jacobeans, you know, the classics. And, you know, they, they were supposed to be the best at it. And so I went there and, you know, I actually, the, the, the best thing I got out of it was I saw so much theater. And so I hadn't, as I said, I didn't grow up seeing theater. So I didn't really know. I didn't go to Stratford. I didn't go see shows. Um, I just did it in high school and like kind of wanted to make people laugh. And to take it seriously became a whole other endeavor. So we would get free tickets and uh, to, to plays all over the city. And so I would be in school from like, you know, 8.30 to like 6.30. And then I'd hit the tube wolf down my sandwich and get to the 7.30 show. And I got to see the, some of the greats on stage. I got to see Ray Fine, Maggie Smith, Brian Cox. I saw the early days of Katie Mitchell's work. I saw some of Peter Brooks' work, Robert Wilson, everything. London's a hub. Everything's coming through there. And I'm seeing all this amazing work. And it's blowing my mind because I'm starting to develop a palette for what I think the theater could be, what it is from practitioners who were not only uh, contemporary theater makers like uh, Robert Wilson um, and Katie Mitchell in particular at the time. But then you have these greats like Maggie Smith. It's like at the time, I don't know, a hundred years old. And, you know, we're in the back cheapest seats of the house of the West End. And she is uh, speaking clearer than any other actor on stage. Um, so you got to see craft, you got to see skill and all these things that we were learning, we started to understand the value of it. And every day at the school, we were told we were the best. You know, we would be the next generation at the RSC and you are going to be amazing. You're amazing and you're going to be famous and you're 19 and you believe them or I believe them. And who at 19 doesn't want to do anything but be famous? So I believe them. And you're at school and you kind of do your thing. And when I came back from second term, I started to kind of see things really differently. I had just broken up a heartbreak. I broke up with a, with a partner. Uh, heartbreak is a great way to um, take off the rosy colored glasses in life. Um, and I just started to experience the city and the, and, and the training in a very different way. And I saw a show that completely changed my life and the course of my life because it didn't fit within any kind of box of anything I was learning. Remember, I'm shaping the idea of what the theater is in this classical setting, in this 
historic institution that has produced great actors. Um, I saw a show called Mnemonic by a company called Complicite, whose artistic director is a man named Simon McBurney. And I had never seen anything like it. It was a devised show. It was about memory. And in it felt like it contained my whole being. And I was like, why are we not doing that at the school? What is that? Um, why are we just doing classics? I need to know what that is. Because I actually felt something. Whereas before in those other shows, I was maybe admiring a craft. I was maybe admiring an ability to kind of sound really good. Here, my soul was shook. And so I wanted to know what that was. So when I came back to school, I was starting to slip. I was looking around me going, wait a minute, what is good? You're telling me that that is good. And I either I'm crazy or you're lying because to me, that's shit. And I don't know who to believe right now because you're telling me that I need to stand straight with my arms at my side and sound really good. And I want something more from that. I know there's something more to this than what you're showing me. So I was 20 years old and I decided to leap. And that is one of the hardest things I think young people will have to go through is to be in a place where everyone tells you things like, you're wrong, just wait it out. Give it another shot. Give it some time. Maybe you're just homesick. No, this isn't for me. I had to find my own palate. I had to find my own articulation that this institution, that this one way of thinking is not the way for me. And so it takes a lot of courage to leave something. And part of it because, was because, you know, as I was saying, I was going to those shows and it was always focused on the individual. It was like that one actor, Ray Fine, Maggie Smith, or the director, Katie Mitchell, Peter Brook. And the show that I saw in the Monic, it wasn't about any individual. It was about the ensemble. It was about the story. It was much bigger than one person. And that's what it made me feel. And I started to become really curious about this tension between an individual and the community or an individual and an ensemble. And what is that dialogue? So I had to seek it out. And again, I was incredibly fortunate. And I had in high school, I had deferred, I got accepted to Tisch School for the Arts in, in New York, and I had deferred it to go to Atlanta. And so I went to Tisch. And New York was an amazing teacher. I mean, um, I have to say the school, you know, while I was in school all the time, I didn't find I was inspired by a lot of the teaching. But the city, the city was an amazing teacher because it taught you to be fearless. Because to be fearless in, in, in expressing your desire for something, because when you expressed your desire, you went for it, you go, you hit the street, you went and you could knock on people's doors. And one of the things about New York that I thought was amazing is you could knock on anyone's door and you could always get in the room. You just had to fight and show up and make sure you earned your spot to stay there. And my history, my, my experience of Canada is completely the opposite. It's almost impossible to get in and it's, it's mediocrity keeps you in that room. So you have these people who stay in rooms just because they showed up. It's not how it worked. And so I found master teachers. I found masters. And when I say masters, what, what, was, what was unique for me about them is at Lambda, it wasn't just arbitrary. It wasn't like, here, I'll make an adjustment and you're better. It, was, it wasn't mystical. It was philosophical and it was practical. So when I saw them work with the students, I could see them change. I could see them get better and I could see them understand how to get better. And the other thing that makes them masters for me is that they all searched for questions with no destination. And it was the curiosity of the exploration of those questions that drove, it was fuel to search. Um, so, you know, I was so fortunate. I just, and I chased them out. I would knock on doors. I got to work and, and hang out with Ann Bogart. Bill Irwin, Jim Calder, Steve Wong, Ron Van Liu, Ellen Lauren, Mary Overly, Wendell Beavers. You might not know any of these names. <clears throat> you should, if you can, Google them. Mary Overly in particular and Anne Bogart are the two people who invented the viewpoints, which is a really um, was at the time a, a pivotal way of looking at dance theater at a time in the 60s in New York when people were looking for another form of storytelling that was going beyond this thing called theater and looking for another kind of expression. Anyways, so the, one of the things that <clears throat> really inspired me, I was 21 years old when I got to work with 
and Bogart and Helen Warren and, and these were these masters of the theater and I'm at their feet. And one of the things they said to me was, you know, the only difference between me and you is experience. That's it. And from an early age, it like dawned on me, oh yeah, I just got to go and get as much experience as possible. That success and failure are both just experience. Neither are to be feared, neither are to be desired. They just are, and they're food. And the more experience you get, that's how you become better. And so I was just constantly knocking on doors. I, I got to, uh, so there's a, this is a whole other conversation, but there's a real divide between undergraduate programs and graduate programs in the States, actually and in Canada too. And um, I, because of one of the teachers, I became, it became a mentor to me. I would just go to classes on the grad acting floor. You know, the grad acting in New York, uh, that NYU is renowned for, you know, famous Hollywood actors have come out of there. But it's not just that. It's the teaching was phenomenal. And again, I got to just sneak into rooms and, and cheat my way in, um, you know, breaking the rules, of course, but I had an inside person helping me. But finding the time and making the time to not sleep and just be there and absorb as much experience as I could. And throughout the time, what was really great, too, was I got to experience uh, ancient theater practices. So ancient practices from Japan, from Italy, from India, from Greece. And what was important about that is that it's all about the body. It's not a book. And what translates, what, what one understands is that we are part of an ancient tradition. It goes back thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years. People have been gathering to try to find a way to communicate and understand this experience called life through story. And that story emerges in a multiplicity of ways, but it all includes the body, whether it's mask, song, dance, uh, spoken song, whatever, it requires the body. And so learning the, through the physicality, through the rhythms that were passed again from thousands of years through the stomping on the ground um, was important to really find a connection that went beyond just the books. So again, in New York, I'm seeing so much theater and I know it's hard to be in Victoria, but nowadays, uh, if you can, I don't know if they do this, but the New York Public Library has so many things online. And I saw I, back in the day, you had to go to the library, you had to check out the videotape and you had to put it in the VCR and watch it. But, you know, I got to see again, um, from all over the world, uh, Senkai Juku, Cloudgate, um, the Wooster Group, uh, Bob Wilson, Peter Brook, again, all the great works that were shaping the kind of conversations in the arts, not only at the time, but also, you know, 20, 30 years earlier. So then two major things happened for me in my time in New York. Number one, September 11, 2001, 9-11 uh, happened. If you don't know it, um, a terrorist attack on New York, to the World Trade Centers were hit with two airplanes, crumbled to the ground. Very traumatic experience for uh, the city, for, the, for America. And um, immediately, especially in New York, because it was this, the, the place where it all happened, you couldn't do anything that wasn't tied to that moment. Everything, your existence was political. Everything you did was political. Walking down the street to get pizza was political. Everything was related to that time in that moment. So my skin color becomes a big problem at a time when, um, you know, Arab terrorists are taking over the world. Um, it's a very charged and incredible time. And the work that we were making, again, everything is always in a dialogue with it. Whatever we made, whatever we thought, it was inevitably uh, tied to it. Whether Even the lightest, fluffiest thing you could think of, it was tied to it. The second thing that happened to me was that I took this class uh, called Radical Street Theater. It was taught by a woman named Jan Cohen Cruz. And I, in that class, it was my third year, and I learned about how theater was at the center of revolutions all around the world. And that theater had this amazing ability to overturn governments, to change the narrative, to fight for justice. And you have stories of people, again, in China, in India, in Thailand, in Mexico, in Chile, in Brazil, all over the world, in Canada, in America, of people using this art form to make extreme um, change, to fight for change. And I learned about two 
practitioners in particular, Augusto Boal, who's based in Brazil, who was based in Brazil, and Ngugi Wafiango, who was based in Kenya, both who were doing very different things, but both who were doing a similar kind of thing in terms of engaging people in major questions around this art form. And one of the things that was said of Ngugi Wafiango's work, um, because he revitalized the Kenyan theater, he, he took it out of the buildings, it was in the streets, it was in the language of the people, and he had to rediscover, again, it was a colonized country, colonized by the British, and they had to refine history. Again, if you think about it too, right, you take away stories, you take away language, you take away music, you take away culture, you take away the, the story of a people. Um, and this is true of any colonized country. And so he, they had to work and find a way to, to, to galvanize the memories of the people to bring that back to life. And someone said of his work that he was seeking alternative visions of existence. Alternative visions of existence. And that was a phrase that was ironed in my head. And especially at the time, because there was a very popular book called, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on it. Oh man, another world is possible. It was everywhere in New York, another world's possible. And so alternative visions of existence. So trying to create a different reality. How do you imagine, how can the theater be a place where you can imagine a different reality, which is what it does. It asks us to imagine. But then if you can imagine in this space, can you translate that imagination into an alternative vision of what you see in the world? So I started finding a different kind of purpose. I was doing very kind of crazy political theater in New York. Um, we were 30 people on stage, buck naked, moving in slow motion to Marvin Gaye sexual healing while nuclear bombs were going off. I didn't even understand half of the shit I was in, but we were in it. And what was great is being surrounded by real working artists. You know, I'm this 22 year old kid, 21 year old kid. And there were 40 year old actors, like New York actors who had real jobs. They weren't the kids I was going to school with who wanted to be on Broadway. It was a very different reality of what it meant and what it cost to be an artist. And so being surrounded by that world really kind of helped me realize, you know, there are other reasons to do this than just be famous. And at the same time, the institution was always calling. And so my talents or my whatever, my luck got me into a program at the public theater in Washington, or sorry, in, in um, New York. So the public theater is a, a very uh, kind of renowned theater for new work. And also it, it, is, it does this Shakespeare in the Park. So you probably have heard of their fancy Shakespeare in the Park, stars and everything. So they have a very, at the time, you know, this is now 2002, um, a summer Shakespeare lab. And so I got into it. And I got into this Shakespeare lab with these, again, amazing teachers who at the time were teaching at NYU grad, at Juilliard, at Yale. Um, I don't name drop them. I, I just say again that those were where I identified where those, those particular teachers were. They had a way of it being philosophical and practical and not mystical. Um, so I'm swinging again between these two extremes of this downtown New York jam and the institution at the public theater. And out of the public theater, I get hired as an actor in Washington, D.C., at the Shakespeare Theater in Washington, D.C. Again, classic institution. The Shakespeare Theater is one of these important regional theaters. And at the time, it's 2003 now. Um, Michael Kahn is the artistic director who was the head of Juilliard. So it's one of these, again, institution, institution, institution. And the story I remember the most, uh, I was there and I was in a production of Midsummer Night's Dream. And I was a dork, you know, it was, I don't, I didn't love to sit in the green room and like play chess. I would always sit, stand in the wings and watch the show and watch the audience watch the show because it was that energy that exchanged, you know, why else, what else am I here to do other than feed off of that? It's more food. And the woman comes out and she's doing that monologue from Helena, the tall one and saying, you know, why don't guys think I'm pretty too? Like they think she's pretty and I should be pretty too. And, a, and it was a student matinee, sorry, it was a student matinee. And a girl in the audience, you know, it was all these kind of urban schools come in and she was like, oh man, I know that. And the audience erupted and she got all flustered. She came back at the intermission. She was like, oh, these fucking kids, they're talking while I'm doing my monologue and I'm, and I'm out there dying. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was like, whoa, they like, they, they actually understood what you said. That's a good thing. What are you talking about? They were excited. Like they were into it. And she was like, no, they're talking. And I was like, oh man, I'm in the wrong place again. Like, if you don't get that that's a win, 
what, what, again, back to Lambda, what's good? What is, what you're telling me what's good. And I, I gotta say, I think you're full of crap and you know, you're this fancy actor. You're, you're important. They pay you more than they're paying me. You've been on TV. I don't know. Maybe you know better than I do. So I really struggled with that. And then again, I couldn't take it. And I left in the middle of the contract. And it's a funny thing. Again, 23 years old at a very fancy theater in Washington, D.C., where New York is just close by, you know, people love to tell you things like, oh, you know what? New York is just next door. You'll never work in that town again. Reputation, 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 which is true. Your reputation always is important. But when it's used as a threat, I mean, you're a kid, you're scared. And so I took the risk, though. I mean, I was like, either I, my soul dies and I collapse here in depression at this terrible theater that you're putting on, or I, I go and try my hand uh, because anything is better than this at this point. Um, so I left and I got a job teaching Shakespeare in the Bronx uh, in an after school program that I got through um, through a guy who I met through the public. And again, I was kind of back home looking at like challenging, why is Hamlet important? Why is this at all interesting to anyone? And being asked hard questions and trying to actually figure it out. And so while I'm doing this, and while I'm excited about doing this community work um, with underprivileged kids, um, that's and I do that because there's a sense of that's not as important as being, you know, on Broadway or, you know, big shows. As I'm doing that, I, a friend that I went to high school with uh, was running a program called Schools Without Borders. And he just so happened that he uh, was looking, I was telling him stories about how inspired I was and how exciting this was. And he said, look, I need someone to run a leadership exchange uh, in, in Nairobi. <laughs> and I was like, what? He's like, yeah, I, I'm like, I need it. I need to know like in a week and you got to come and you got to run a program. And I was like, I'm not a teacher, uh, but I can go to, I can come to learn. And keep in mind, Nairobi, Kenya, Ngugi uh, uh is from there. So I think about it and my life is just starting to change. And at the same time as this moment is happening, I'm very lost and unsure about what the next step is. And I decide to, I think about that one company that, that I saw in Complicite, a lot of those people went to a school called the Lecoq School in France. And I thought, well, look, life is calling me to jump. If I can jump, maybe, maybe that's what I should do. And so in one summer, before I knew it, I had applied and got into Lecoq, and I was going to Nairobi and going to do these uh, exchanges. And so what began was a real deep relationship with this organization in which I was doing summers in Nairobi and in Rio, Boal and Biongo, and I was running these leadership exchanges in which we were using theater to talk about the social issues of the day. And I was working with all these people in so many different contexts who were using the arts to engage their communities out of um, severe issues. Like in Kenya, it's about AIDS, HIV education and idleness and alcohol. In Rio, it's a drug trade in the favelas. And there, people are using such creative strategies. They're using soccer in, in Nairobi. They're using soccer. They're using photography. They're using theater. In Rio, they're using hip hop. They're using graffiti. They're using photography. All these other these strategies in which arts is trying to provide a way of life for people. It's trying to take them out of a kind of um, trade, essentially, a negative trade, and put them into a positive situation where maybe they can generate an income. Maybe they can find hope and a, and a way forward in life. And so I'm in this world of like arts and community building. And then I'm at the same time and the other times of the year, I'm in Paris at the Lecoq School. Now the Lecoq School is a bananas place. Uh, it's a very specialized school where, you know, in its 50 some odd years, there's probably only 2000 people who have ever gone there. And it's such a unique place because, you know, I tell people, when we talk about intercultural or multicultural or, or anything like that, it's the only place in the world where I had maybe 52 countries represented in that first year I was at school. Everything from Africa, South America, America, all various types of Europeans, Australians, Asians, all this mix of cultures is present where we have to, most people are speaking in French, which is a second language. 
Language is a problem. So we have this only thing, this way of communicating with our bodies. And we're looking for a kind of poetry that goes beyond language. That is, an, again, an imaginative space um, yeah, to communicate, to tell stories. And so it was a really special place for me that really taught me how to observe and how to see um, and how to um, find the tools and the words and the ability to articulate a vision and bring it to life in front of an audience. And also, you know, Paris is an incredible teacher. The city that you're in is an unbelievable teacher um, in that the rhythm of the city is one thing. Excuse me, the art that's in the city is another thing. And, and then the people on the street, you know, so much of our time at Lecoq, we were only at school for four hours a day. And the rest of the time you had a job or you were out on the street observing people, experiencing Paris. And Paris is like a strange kind of collision of ancient and modern um, all into one. The, 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 the neighborhood of where Lecoq is situated is so strange. You have a, a prostitute lane at where, you know, they're like 70 years old. They've been doing it forever. This time hasn't changed on that street. And then next to it is like all Indian restaurants. That's all new immigrants. And it's all this kind of collision. And then the French bistro that just wants to stay the same way, but has to deal with these immigrants. Like the collision of, of problems with time in that city is, is magnificent. And another huge catastrophic event happens for me like 9-11, only it's called uh, the fires in the banlieue. And in 2005, two young Arab men were um, chased by police and electrocuted on a fence. And Paris was on fire. Everything was lit on fire. The suburbs were on fire. And, you know, Paris was one of the most racist places I've ever lived uh, in terms of their relationship to Arab pe looking people, in terms of your accent and your language. Um, and it was really felt. It was really present on the streets and the interactions with the police. And again, you can't help but be part of a conversation, even in a tiny little bubble of a school everything you're making is in some kind of tension with that uh, context that you're in. That you're in, in you're, you're, it's impossible to, to be separated from that. Um, and so I think the thing I would just highlight there too is, is, is that was a school that, you know, was the one institution being very small that was interested in other ways. There was no one way to do anything. There was no, um, it was always, what did you want to do? What did you want to say? Of course, there was a sort of tight box for you to fit in to understand rules. But within that, you, there was so much room to find your own voice. And, and I really found my own voice there to, um, again, find the tools to articulate what it was I was trying to do with an ensemble of people. And that's the core of the school is really about working together, collaborating with people who you don't share the same language with, who you don't seem to share the same culture with, and finding a common ground in a language that accepts all differences and uses them as a strength to tell a new story. Um, and I would say on that, you know, this is a Lecoq School advertising right now, but I would just say, like, you know, in terms of you guys and young people at a school, I think, again, the thing that was unique for me about it, it was it's a real forward-facing art school in that I find a lot of theater training is really about preservation. It's about, you know, my time at Lambda. It's about, you know, this is how you do it. Chekhov did it like this. You should do it the same way. You know, Ray Fiennes does it like this. And it's, it's, it's sort of designed on a theater of the past or ideas of a time when theater was a certain thing. And Lecoq for me was forward facing. The students were the ones to come and generate that next generation, that, that next evolution of what this, this thing is. Again, why theater? What is theater? If we can go back 4,000 years to stomping in the ground, it's evolved over time and it continues to evolve. And so how to be in a space where we understand that evolution is continual and not preserved in some kind of idea of what it once was. The last thing I'll mention about it that was really particular for me as an Indian person or someone who's had a relationship with India because I'm Canadian and I'm, I'm whiter than probably most of you, um, is that I, I surprisingly discovered something that I had read about and I, I remember being shook by this in two instances. One, you know, in, at NYU and studying and learning these practices and, and engaging in them 
I always read about how Peter Brook, um, um, Antonin Artaud, Manushkin, all these greats of the theater, Bertolt Brecht, they all went to the East. They all went to India and to Asia and to Thailand, and they discovered roots of the theater because that's where ancient times were. And they brought them to the West, and they're, that's what made them unique and interesting. And so my entrance to the East was always through that lens. But the brownness of it was always taken away. The value of it was always taken away. And I was really struck. At one moment, I remember an exercise. I had just got back from a trip to India, actually. And I had gone to a temple, and I'd seen Kathakali performance. And it blew me away. It's like 2 in the morning, and I saw this thing. And this guy was doing a B in the performance. He was doing this. And I come back to school and we do, um, we're learning kind of gestural language and, and there's all this mime and that it hit me so quickly that, oh, the roots of this thing called mime are actually not French. They're rooted way back in this tradition that I come from. They're not external from me. They're, they're me. And it was a profound discovery of finding myself and my own position in this Western world, in this story of the avant-garde and the work. And two other stories I'll tell with that that was profound is um, I was taking, I happened, long story, I'm in Sweden, I'm taking a no class, no theater, Japanese ancient, taught by a, a, a Latino man named uh, Abel Solares. I'm in Sweden and we're sitting and he's kind of giving a, a chat in the middle of the work and he's talking about the, the, the meaning of ancient theater and the importance of ancient theater. And uh, in one example, he's talking, this is, so this is earlier in my career. I'm probably 22. Uh, I don't know much. And he goes, he's telling the class, you know, uh, you know, it's like ancient theater, right? Like it's so important. And, you know, and he points to me and he goes like you, Patakali. And, you know, my whole life, I'm, ex I'm always confused in a lot of ways as someone who's from India because, well, I look like one. Um, but I don't have those roots. I don't have those traditions. It's always been a loss and a missing. So he points to me and he goes like, you cut the collie, right? And I was like, no, sorry, bro. I don't, I don't got nothing. And he looked at me closely. He said, how do you not know cut the collie? I said, well, I, I just never, I don't, I don't know. And he grabbed my, my arm and he grabbed it and he goes, that theater is in your veins. You need to connect to it. And I thought, holy shit, like that's, that is in my veins. It's, it's, I'm from a tradition. And for so much of my time in the theater, I'm always made to be an outsider. I'm always made to feel outside this thing. But actually, it's mine. <laughs> I'm the center. And that solidified for me. In 2010, I met this director from the UK, Jatinder Verma, pioneer for South Asian theater in the UK. If you ever get to study him, he's amazing. And, you know, like, they would put on shows and then come outside and then get into fights. The racism was so rich in the 60s, 70s UK. It meant something to put on a show. It meant something to tell your story. It wasn't just a right. You had to, you had to literally fight for it, fight for your place. And he said, you know, when asked about being a culturally specific company, and he was like, no. The thing that, that he learned at an early age was that our roots were different roots to creation. So our roots are different routes to creation. So rather than being the culturally specific, we are the avant-garde. We've traditionally been the avant-garde. We are the ones shaping. We are the ones informing the work that is cool. So now I come to Canada, 2007, and I have to start Why Not Theater. I say have to start Why Not Theater because no one wanted to work with me. I had the craziest resume you could ever imagine a human being ha having. No one would give me a job. No one wanted to hire me as an actor. No one wanted to hire me as a director. Why would they? They don't know me, right? And so you have to start a company. How else can you make work? And that's the system that you're in. And then 15 years later, I'm, I want to say I'm one of the few, if not the only company, why not is, to have collaborated with every single institution in Toronto every single one, except for YPT, although I did a workshop at YPT. Anyway, doesn't matter. Just to kind of show you the, the changing the narrative, changing the story of, of what it is to, to meet someone on first sight. So just some quick context about Toronto when I came here. You know, I came here in 2007, and it was 
there was a big movement for youth arts. So 2005 in Toronto was the summer of the gun, where because of the government, they had cut a bunch of after school programs. And there were a lot of shootings in, in one summer. And there was a lot of outrage that the school programs that were cut were a direct result of this violence. And so how do we create change? So a ton of money was being poured into the youth art sector. And I was lucky enough, again, Schools Without Borders was around at a time when a, the, a, an organization called the Remix Project was being given birth, which was like a hip hop business fashion design school that was based on Fresh Arts. Fresh Arts was an old program that gave birth to like Cardinal Pichal, Mishimi, really big Canadian hip hop artists. And then this major uh, hip hop festival called Manifesto was also emerging at the time. So three massive kind of groups of people. And what was unique about this community was here you had the highest level of beatboxers, break dancers, the t photographers, graffiti artists, um, all range of artists who were working at the highest level in their, in their field internationally, but then all rooted in, their, in the mentorship of their own community. And so they balanced these two worlds of mentorship in their communities. I'm from Scarborough, Scarborough is where I represent, and I do the work in my community while I'm in Berlin at the beatboxing championship number one in the world. So this dialogue of uh, community and, and, and arts is kind of happening at the same time. What, what time are we at? I've been talking a long time. How much time do I have left? Anyone know? Yeah, you've got- Four, five, uh, 13 here. Yeah, so you can talk for five, 10 more minutes and we can open up some questions. Okay, I'm gonna speed through here. So well, why not theater? Okay. So, uh, so that's happening. So then time passes. I make this company, Why Not Theater. Uh, Why Not Theater is an international theater company based in Toronto. We basically do three things. We make and tour international work that's at the intersection of equity and innovation. And so basically no two shows are ever the same. And we challenge the status quo of what stories are told and who gets to tell them. So that's everything from Jan mentioned my show with my mother, who's a real life immigrant, real, real life immigrant as opposed to fake one. Um, she's my mom. Um, and we tell the story of how my parents tried to arrange my marriage. Uh, it didn't go so well, but it's a very funny story. Um, recently uh, creating a production of Hamlet that's both uh, in American Sign Language and English, it's bilingual. And uh, at the center is a deaf character, a, a female Hamlet, defying gender, race, and abilities, and how we tell the story to find it new again. Um, if you go to the website, you can kind of see more work. And I, I'll show some clips if I get there. <laughs> The second thing we do is we share our resources to support other artists work. So this means we have a full time, a producer that we pay full time who's dedicated to producing the work of other people because it's shitty and impossible and hard to produce in any city. And so our, uh, what I didn't say was when I became a company, I wanted to break the structure and, and to redefine what it meant to be a company. Because it's all the same. It's all one artistic director does one thing and a show a year. How do we break this open? So making touring work uh, that's innovative and equitable, sharing our resources with other people. So we're helping to develop. Um, right now we're supporting uh, 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 two, uh, two women, uh, Liza Paul Bahia Watson, um, Don Jenny Burley, who I'll show you videos with to start her own deaf-led company. Um, and a myriad of artists where, where, again, we're supporting them with our resources so that they can develop their work. The third thing we do is we provoke systems change by removing the barriers of access for participation in the arts for artists and audiences. So that's all kinds of new ways of thinking and new ways of thinking how we make the arts. That's innovative ticketing models, innovative producing models like the Riser. The Riser Project is collaborative producing model. Again, go to the website. Um, we're now moving it nationally. Uh, to Edmonton next year and hopefully to Saskatchewan and maybe we'll get closer to Victoria. Um, and we're uh, trying to share that model because it's been very helpful for helping emerging artists in particular make money for their, from their art. The other the two things in Provoke I also want to share is um, right now we're working with the city of Toronto to access underutilized spaces in Toronto to turn them into temporary rehearsal halls. So a lot of the way that, that companies grow is by building buildings. And when we were growing, as Jan said, we grew very quickly in, in the last four years. Everyone said, go buy a building. And we were like, why would we do that? It's a terrible business model. And we can't help the people we want to help because there's more people to help than, than just one building. So we said, what if we imagined all of the empty spaces in Toronto as our theater? 
How do we get access to them and turn them into rehearsal halls? If we could make space free for artists, who could we enable to tell stories and what audiences of the future could we eventually build? So that's the space project. And all this is on our website. And then this gen fellowship is a really unique fellowship where we um, are supporting um, BIPOC, female, trans, and non-binary artists from across Canada. KP Dennis is based in Vancouver or Victoria, I think, who's awesome, who's a, a This Gen fellow, um, where we have a, a director stream um, that's primarily Black and Indigenous artists and Black and Indigenous teachers from all around the world, and a cultural leader stream where we pair uh, artists up with international mentors of the highest caliber, Crystal Pite, Akram Khan, um, Wesley Enoch, um, just a stellar artist to provide access and mentorship and training. And part of that is really kind of goes back to this feeling about the world. And I'll, I'll fast forward, I was going to show some videos, but I'll fast forward to uh, this last story around leadership. And I was an associate artistic director at the Soul Pepper Theater, which is a major theater in Toronto. And uh, I was one of the first. And at the time, this is to give you a sense of how fast things have changed. At the time, I was the only person of color to have to have that kind of position at a national institution ever in the history of Canada. And I was an associate artistic director at the time. And there's a lot of pressure on me. There's a lot of pressure when you have a job like that. And I really struggled hard. I lasted six months in the job. And it was very challenging because I could see all the stories that I understood of systemic racism, the barriers that I saw and understood that my colleagues went through, that I was going through, they were real. And I was at the tables now watching them unfold. And that is hard to stomach. And all the time there, I was told, oh, well, you're, who's the next Ravi Jane? You're so smart. You're the only one who talks like you. You're the only one who does what you do. And you're told that enough. It's like Lambda. You start to believe it. And luckily, I had the sense and the fortune to be able to travel around the world and see that I wasn't the only one. That there are a ton of amazing artists, leaders of color who are doing it better than anyone in this country is doing. And I know them. And so I brought them all to Toronto to have a conference. And what's important about that is about, again, sort of the thesis of all this is where's the center? Is the center the institution or is the center where you, where your voice is and where your opinions are and where your thinking is? And I was able to centralize a world, a community around me that empowered me to believe and understand that, there, that we could make something new. And so the fellowship, that, that conference evolved into the This Gen Fellowship. And I just share that because it was about finding the way to, again, break the mold of what, what could be possible and what people's expectations were and how do you defy expectations. And again, that's what we ask of ourselves as artists. So let's ask that of ourselves and our producing in the way we imagine alternative visions of existence. So... Yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm running out of steam and running out of time. So I had some videos to show, but all that to say, um, you know, please check out our website, why not theater, um, And you can learn more about what we do and how we got there. And I'm happy to take questions. And, you know, at the end of the day, I hope that if any of this story just inspires you to challenge assumptions and how you get from A to B, because it, getting from A to B is a line you invent. And that goes for your artistic practice, that goes for the systems that you're part of and the ones you invent to support what you do. Ravi, did you want to show the videos? Uh, I'm happy, yeah, why not? Sure. Sure. So um, the first video is from a show we created. So this kind of brought, brings the story full circle. I ended up collaborating with Complicity by a whole, Complicity was the company that I saw, saw mnemonic Eventually, I ended up um, collaborating with them, uh, and it's a beautiful show. It's non-actors. It's called Like Mother, Like Daughters. It was a spinner, spin-off of Brimple of Asha, and just to give you uh, just a sense of this small piece that was, uh, you know, again, looking at diff who gets to tell the story. Read the cards in the order I find them. Mum, you will answer. I am going to ask you whoa, the next 20 questions in rapid fire. What does it mean to be a good person? If you could give me one piece of parenting advice, what would it be? Was I well behaved as a child? 
do you <laughs> think we value the same things in life? What is your biggest regret? Do you think you would survive alone in the wilderness? Uh, do I annoy you? Yeah. <laughs> Does my love for you ever feel like pressure? Hmm. I wouldn't say pressure. What I would say is because I don't live at home, sometimes it's like, when are you coming home? Why are you doing this? <laughs> Where are you going? If I wasn't related to you, would you like me? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, but I'd probably find you really annoying also. <laughs> is your relationship with your mother similar to our relationship? Um, I've never talked to her so openly as you talk to me. I got to know my dad when, when I was older and he was the most amazing man. The most, I mean, I could actually start to cry about this because he was. And I wish that I'd known him better earlier. What about me do not understand? <laughs> Why you hoard paper? Oh. <laughs> Do you have to be tough to survive? Yes. I think so. And especially a mother who is in my situation has to be tough. I'm very proud of the work that I've done in my life. My children are my greatest achievement. That's the end of the game. Thank you all for playing. Um, and would everybody now please join us for something to eat? So yeah, so that was a show um, with non-actors. Uh, we did it in England and it was all about what are the things you pass down on the matriarchal line, um, tradition, culture, food, how do we have those conversations? And so the, um, the mothers were born somewhere else and the daughters were born uh, in the country where we were, which was England at the time. Um, okay, the last, why don't we just show the third one? The third one is a great little video that just shows uh, kind of progress, work in progress with Don Janney Burley, who is, uh, has a company called 1S1, who we're helping uh, set up. Uh, she's an amazing Canadian artist who's based in Finland, a uh, deaf artist, and we're helping her set up a company. And this is just a great little video of a collaboration we did with her that just kind of gets into this conversation about intercultural um, exchange. You also need to figure out language. You have to talk to each other. How are you going to communicate? Especially since you all don't speak the same languages. There's no interpreter in this world. You all need a common language. create language? How do we understand each other? How do we get an audience to understand us in a world that I'm not speaking English and Don's not finding American Sign Language, but we're kind of finding a point of intersection that's neither signed nor spoken, but that is kind of universal. This collaboration is probably outside of my comfort zone because no, normally I will rely on that I understand the cultural codes, maybe and the context of things. Now suddenly I don't necessarily, but I cannot leave. I have to stay in the in the problem and figure out how to be a part of it. You know, a lot of the actors are talking about listening. How do we listen to each other when we don't have a common language? Um, how do we listen to the differences of cultures that we have? The depth of visual language that Don and Ramesh have access to just because it's the nature of their language. So I think I realized, I was like, oh my God, I have to do so much work just to get to their level because that's, their, that's the nature of their language. Figuring out what the rules would be in terms of uh, creating a language and what the grammar and vocabulary would be has been a really interesting search. Here we are with two deaf actors and two hearing actors 
um, different cultures from around the world, all present working on a new play in a very new way. So beautiful, um, Bobby. Oh, thanks. Fantastic. Um, I, we got a question that came up uh, from one of our students. Ravi, is there a particular lesson that you have learned from a mistake that has shaped how you approach your work? I mean, you know, I think I'm struggling with the question because I make so many mistakes. Um, there's probably no one that I would say that defines it. Um, you know, mistakes, like I said earlier, it, it's all lessons. It's, it's, you know, you have to go into life knowing that you'll make mistakes and it's how you respond to them that defines your character and, and who you are and what, what you're about and what your values are. And so I think that for me, every mistake is a kind of constant recheck on that. Um, and so because I'm making them a lot, I'm rechecking the values at every stage, um, which I think is important to do and, and check yourself. What do I really mean by this? What do I feel about this? Um, so it's not yourself, that's probably, that is what I do. And I think um, hitting the wall continuously is um, why my face looks the way it does. Yeah. <laughs> I, really, I really appreciate how, uh, how you've pivoted at times in your life. Your, your decision to leave Lambda, as you say, was huge. Um, and and you know, quitting, quitting uh, the Shakespeare company, again, huge, but just, just your knowledge that it, it was time to pivot. Um, another question, what is one of the newest goals that you've given yourself at the point that you are now in, at your, in your career? And is it any different from the goals that you had when you were starting out? So what is one of the newest goals that you have given yourself at the point that you are now in your career? And is it any different from the goals that you have given yourself when you were starting out? Yeah, I mean, I think... That's a great question. I think that for me right now, um, it's no diff. The thing that is different is maybe the scale. And I think I'm trying to impact big change. I think my goal right now is to really build a new institution, mm -hmm. to build one that is um, unlike, unlike anything anyone has seen, but not just for that reason. Unlike what we have seen, because it, it facilitates better access, it is more innovative and supports more people and is able to uh, maximize the resources um, in ways that most institutions don't. So I would love to um, make a new institution. And my story about Soul Pepper was at the time I was, you know, growth in the arts doesn't happen. Um, it's rare. What happens is, individual artists tend to have to wait till they get an artistic director job at a big fancy institution and they're rare and too far between and if you get it you have access to a lot of resource and if you don't you kind of just stay where you are and so to grow institutions is not a common thing and i was lucky because the year the time when i left soul pepper the canada council changed all of its criteria and we ticked every box it was all about what we had been doing for the last 10 years, innovation, equity, inclusion, international. It was all the values that we had to fight for for 10 years of little resource squandering. And finally, we were empowered to run at the level that we deserved. And from there, that's when me and my team said, let's build something new. Let's do it. Like, fuck it. We can do it. And, and now we have a little bit of oxygen. And so oddly enough, we're at a position now where we maybe could do it. It's so fucking hard. It's not, it's not easy, but, but, but we can. And I think to me, what's exciting is now we're at the scale, maybe we can, and it might be worth the risk. One last question before you go, Ravi. Uh, how is your belief in collaboration reflected in your organizational hierarchy and structure? In the room or, the, or, or why not? 
Um, organizational. Not sure. Sorry. Um, perhaps um, okay. uh, Aaron. Oh, why in what at why not? Uh, Aaron. Oh man. That's, yeah, that's an exciting conversation. And um, we've been doing a big restructure over the whole COVID and during uh, Black Lives Matter and thinking about white supremacy and uh, restructuring the company. So actually my title is now co-artistic director and founder. Miriam Fernandez is the co-artistic director and Kelly Reed is the executive director. And we have um, a kind of structure we're playing with where we are centralizing collaboration and trying to decentralize um, I wouldn't say decentralized power, but empower more people to be part of decision making. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's a longer conversation. Uh, I'm hoping we are going to write something about it quite soon uh, to try to put out in the world. Realistically, I'm going to say probably the fall, um, but keep an eye out for that. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ravi. It's been fantastic hearing you speak. Um, very, very inspiring. Um, just want to remind the students that there is uh, another event starting at two o'clock that you have access to, which is a full hour of questions and answers uh, with Ravi. So, so do join us with your questions if you weren't able to answer them or get them asked today. And once again, thank you so much, Ravi. All the best. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. Bye. Ciao.